Uh, thanks, Morris, and thanks to John and the team in DFI just for, for giving myself and Marion the opportunity to kind of have a meeting like this with you. And I suppose the fact that it is being taped and so on is good in that it can disseminate out around uh, a wider audience. So I suppose what I wanted to do is um, the, the first slide here, I want to cover the ground in the sense that, as Morris said, I've previously done some presentations around the place. I've given a presentation of the consultative forum, which I think you have. And I just wanted to, to recap on that, to take the strategic focus and the vision side of it, if you like, where are we trying to go? Then maybe to look at the, you know, the service plan has been launched. I think you've seen that, but we have our divisional plan for social care. And to look at that at a high level, what are the high level messages? But then more importantly, perhaps, to go through some of the detail of that and look at some of the specifics in terms of uh, what we're trying to do. And in my sense, it's trying to translate the strategy and vision into reality. I think that's what we are trying to do. So maybe just to start uh, with that, the, the, the first slide, uh, the first couple of slides, I suppose, um, when I was doing the presentation, I suppose if I look at my own role coming in as a national director for the next number of years, um, to me, reform is probably the kernel. It's the cornerstone of, of what we want to do. And around that is about developing a person-centred model uh, of service for older people and people with a disability and all the good stuff about promoting independence and lifestyle choice, uh, enabling that insofar as we can, maintaining people within their own communities and so on, but also developing a sustainable model uh, that can be funded and resourced appropriately. Um, and that's the, the reform side of it, and we translate that into action on a day-to-day -day basis through our service plan. So we need to sustain service delivery, but we also need to drive the change that we're planning through our service plan by setting out key actions that we're going to deliver and hold ourselves to account around the delivery of that. So the second slide, or the next slide there is, these were just my own thoughts um, when I was coming into the role. If I was to look at what would be different for older people or people with a disability at the end of my time. And I just identified six of those which are related to um, the policy context and all that we're trying to do. And I think I was trying to shape it that if we had, in my mind, implemented these specific things, I would say we'd have made a significant change. And it's around um, access to information and advice and support for people in terms of decision making. It's about putting service users and their families in the local community at the centre of the decisions and how you organise your services. That brings you into areas about maximising uh, the benefits in an informal way of local communities and how do we harness that. It also brings you into things about people having a say in the resource that's used for them, and we talk about getting to individualised budgeting, but how are we going to do that, and we want to do that, and that's part of what we want to achieve. And also the voice being heard isn't always as successful as we'd wish. We aspire to do a lot of things, but how can we make that more real? And I suppose also about having a wider range of options as we move to a commissioning type model and a different approach to how we deliver services, how are we going to do that? So, they were the type of things um, that I was thinking of as the outcomes for myself and the team and ourselves as a sector at the end of my term in office, if you like. And I suppose we have in this slide just an indication of there's a very strong policy platform there. Like a lot of the reports and analysis and stuff have been done uh, around disabilities in particular, and I've included some of the elderly services stuff there as well. And there are some shared things across elderly and disability, like assessment of needs, service user involvement, research and demographics, all that type of stuff. And so that platform is there, and just to acknowledge that. And then with the emergence of the divisions and ourselves, I have touched, and you've seen this previously, about the structure that's emerging within the health service now. And so at a national level, I'm a national director of social care, but I'm a on the governing body of the health service now. So Tony O'Brien, myself and my colleague national directors with Laverne McGuinness as the chief operating officer and Tom Byrne as the chief finance officer, we are the governing body of the organisation. So while I have a remit in terms of social care, I also have in the directorate an organisation-wide, system-wide responsibility. There's the leadership team, which is the management team in, in effect. And then we have what's called the planning, performance and assurance group. So it's a control group that looks, how are we getting on? How is the system performing? That type of thing. So there's a process around that. And below that then is our own social care management team. So myself and Marion and colleagues that I've set out here. We have an operations head and service improvement head for older people, disability, which Marion holds, a head of performance and planning. We'll be involving a clinical lead 
and Noel Mulvihill is the head of quality and standards. So that's the team. And I suppose, importantly as well, the National Consultative Forum, I've mentioned that as a key um, support to us in implementing change, as is the National Implementation Framework and a steering group that has been established by the Minister. So I see them as two really important pieces. And also then, from a service delivery point of view, we're working through ISAs at the moment. There's an ISA review that will be published uh, you know, in the near future, and that will set out a new structure for community services. And there's a reform process. But within that, I think you know, the National Consultative Reform and processes like this are really important to us in how we embed your input into the change and the work that we're doing. So that, if you like, is the structural side of it. That's the high-level policy and the vision. And then in terms of the service plan in the current year, what's the key messages from a disability point of view? If you were just to summarise it in the two slides, this first one, on the funding, we have just over three billion. About a billion and a half of that is in the disability side, and about a billion and a half of it is in the elderly side. Um, included in that are just over 31 million of reductions. And the reductions relate to pay and pay-related savings that are required. So it's Haddington Road and the Employment Control Framework, so the moratorium essentially. So there's no other cuts to disability in the current year apart from Haddington Road and the pay-related savings associated with the moratorium. And what we set out there is that the HRA is around 11.5 million uh, and the other pay-related reduction is about four. So about 15 or so million is now identified uh, in terms of the pay and pay-related reductions. And the idea is to try to use Haddington Road and mechanisms like that to actually implement those without impacting on services. So that's what the challenge for us is. On the positive side, there's 14 million euro developments coming to the, the sector, and I'll go through those in a minute. And then there's also uh, 31 million has been provided by the rest of the organisation to support deficits that existed in disability and elderly services. So that's a really positive thing from the social care domain. At the end, when I took up office, there was about 53 million of a deficit when you added it all up around the country. There's a contribution of 31 million being made to that. And that's an important piece. So it's an important positive to the sector. Um, if I go on to the next one, um, I suppose in terms of the key pieces, as I talked about the reform, the VFM and policy review is hugely important. And I think of it as more than just the VFM report. It's the whole policy review associated with that. And I know John has views which he's communicated about the breadth of the VFM report. But I think the policy review encompasses the totality of our sector, uh, not just uh, the intellectual disability side or anything else. It encompasses the totality of it, and that's the way we'll be looking at it. There's a national implementation framework that I mentioned and the consultative forum. I see the, those as key supporting mechanisms, and I see this as part of that process, this kind of engagement. On the 14 million, essentially there's three pieces to that. School leavers, 1,200 people leaving. Um, uh, school or need... Uh, to exit from rehabilitation training and so on. So there's about 7 million going towards that. Emergency places, about 3 million, and 4 million to roll out uh, the Not to 18 programme. And what I see with all our resource, both the new money and the existing money, is that we will be trying to use resource as a driver of change. So while we always focus on the new money and 14 million and so on, we have a billion and a half, and we need to look at how are we using that billion and a half and see what we can do to reorganise how we spend that and use it in delivering our model of service. Um, we also talk about the new, the 14 million, but there is a requirement in line with the VFM policy review and many other uh, analysis that has been done to reorganise how we deliver our services. So if we are going to have a person-centred model, as I talked about in the vision, well, we need to reorganise how we are, and that's going to be a key piece, starting in 2014 with a step change in how we're implementing that. So that's a really important piece. On the VFM side, there's a target of 5 million associated with that of savings to be achieved. That's not a budget reduction. It's actually to reduce over-expenditure and cost in the system. So we're not cutting people's budget about that, but we are looking to save 5 million. And that 5 million will be available to us in terms of, um, you know, if you take that cost out of the system, you shouldn't be able to, uh, it shouldn't negatively impact on the system. We're going to drive procurement and shared service type approaches 
in particular, but we will also be looking at how we reorganise our model of service to change how we, the cost of some of that. And I suppose that was mentioned by Morris, the whole issue of streamlining governance and governance as an issue is a really important piece for us in 2014 and beyond. So that's the high level, and that's what we would have been communicating when we launched the plan and so on. But obviously, that's the high level side of it. When you get into the detail of that, um, how do we actually make the changes and the vision, how do we translate the vision into reality on the ground? And I think that's part of what we're trying to do. And one of the things I would see with that is that we would use our service plan and our operational plan every year to embed within the actions that we commit to taking a delivery of that model over time. So <coughs> we've broken down the plan into these type of headings of person-centered model of service and supports. We need to change that. Um, and to me, there's two pieces to that. The first is that we need to, in 2014, do fairly important strategic work about putting a plan in place and doing an analysis, consulting with people as we go to actually set out how will we do this in a sustained way over three to five years. And so you need to put that strategic piece of work into play. And we'll be doing that with the National Implementation Framework Steering Group. We'll be engaging with the consultative forum and in processes like this as we go. Um, there's obviously a commitment to the demonstration projects. Um, to me, a really important thing is that we need to set what's the baseline. If we're going to evaluate progress over a number of years, you need to have a baseline to start from. And therefore, I think some of the work we have to do is to establish that and then put a, an agreed evaluation process into place that we assess this and look at how we're progressing and learn from what we're doing over three to five years and see how we're getting on. Nobody has uh, ownership of all the wisdom that's required. Like We need to learn from what we do, and that's the idea of demonstration sites, our pilots, our new ways of modelling, and I think that's what we want to try and do. As part of that, I would see what I'm calling national guidelines are a process that's agreed. This is how we'll do it, and this is how we think collectively as a sector we'll be able to implement sustainable change over time. This also is how we will convince the Department of Public Expenditure and government that the model that we're implementing is the appropriate model and that it needs to be resourced accordingly. Equally with that, there'll be a requirement from government to ensure that we're using the billion and a half we have already to best advantage. And there's strong evidence there that if we reorganise the model of delivery, that we could do more with what we have to the benefit of people. And I think that's what is an important piece for us. Government, you know, if we're looking for more without addressing that ourselves, I think it's hard to get the voice heard about looking for more. I think there was a commitment this year that we have got 14 million additional, but there's an expectation on us as a sector in 2014 and future years that we will start to really implement and make meaningful change to the model that we're talking about. And there's, there's a recognition too that we need to learn about that as we're going on. I've talked about cross-agency working and so on. A really important piece is what I call you know, building a community development approach. To me, that's really important. Part of my own approach over many years has been about enabling local communities to support their own. I think that's what you need to do. That's easier said than done. And much of what we are talking on the vision side is around that. And it's around taking a whole system approach and a whole of service approach. It's cross-sector. It's not just the health service. But I think we need to work collectively on doing that. And it is about embedding change. And I want to work with yourselves and others to start to embed this change within the system over time. Um, <coughs> there are some of the specifics that we're going to do. I don't need to go into that in too much detail. What I wanted to say is that what you'll see in the plan, hopefully, is that we're trying to take a more planned, a responsive approach from a management point of view. This isn't a dictatorship. The fountain of all knowledge doesn't rest with the health service or with the HSE or with any one group. <laughs> There's a learning process there. There are shared responsibilities, and we need to work in that way. Of course, it will be challenging. Of course, we'll be challenging. But equally, we'll be listening and hearing to what people are saying. And I want to develop some kind of process of engagement where we can mediate that and work it through in a progressive way so that we build a consensus of how we're going forward. I'm using the school leavers as an example. You'll see there that we've taken certain things and we have specific timelines, targets, and deliverables that we're saying we're going to achieve. We want to demonstrate that as a system we can organize 
services for school leavers and people exiting rehabilitation training in a, more, in a better and simpler way than we have in the past, and that by the time it comes to the 30th of June and people are breaking up, that we're able to tell people where the services are going to be. So we have a commitment to do that. We won't get it absolutely right the first year, I've no doubt. It'll be a significant improvement, I hope, but we will learn from what we do and we'll implement a better system next year. That's, I suppose I'm just using that as an example that I hope that you would see that in the plan as we go forward and that as we implement things every year, it's, the reform becomes part of what you're doing day to day. In terms of service user involvement and community involvement, I've put that in there. In the vision and what we want to try and achieve, it is about you know, engaging and maximising the potential of local communities. As I say, that's easier said than done. But again, I think that through organisations like yourselves, and we've started discussions with, with John and the team, as to how can we collaborate with yourselves and the, the network of agencies and the network of people who you're engaged with, that we can translate that into a positive resource to support the change and the work that we're trying to do collectively. <laughs> And to do that in a way that works for you and for us. Um, in terms of a whole system approach and the whole issue of health and well-being, that will be something that you will see a much more joined up approach on, I would hope, over time. And again, we want a contribution. I would see your organisations through DFI and that type of uh, connectivity that you have as really an important um, driver for changing and supporting us in changing the model around that. But again, we need to move from um, doing that successfully in pockets to doing it su successfully in a sustainable way consistently across the country. That's really important, and we need to work with yourselves uh, to work through how we do that sensibly. The notion of nothing about us without us, many of you would talk to us around that. And I think that's something, again, that we need to make um, more real within the health service and part of that is going to be an engagement with organisations like yourselves to help us in our efforts to try and do that. I also believe that if you're trying to significantly implement a change programme like we're talking about, you do have to build a coalition of support across all the sector. So the voluntary sector, organisations like yourselves, local communities, the staff and the unions associated with them, the political system. We need to work collectively on that to actually be able to convince and demonstrate that what we're doing is the right thing, that we're using the resource we have to best advantage and that we will need more resource in different ways as we go forward. But we have to build that coalition of support collectively as we do that. We won't always agree on everything about that, but I think that you can work collaboratively and still disagree on many things. And for us, I think it's really important that how we do this is really important. It needs, for me and for the team, it is about engagement, and working collaboratively, but also implementing change at pace. So we can't spend forever talking about what we need to do. We need to make things happen. We need to make things happen in 2014. But we also need to collaborate. And how we engage and change with you, that will be an important piece. And we want to work with you to see how do we do that best together. <coughs> I think um, quality and standards is a hugely important piece for us. Um, the byline at the bottom is one that Tony O'Brien has been using and has often said about although care costs poor, quality care costs more. And that's very true. Um, and for us, client safety and cli high quality service delivery is paramount. And we are making that very much a cornerstone of what we do. But that will bring challenges to us. We are going to be rolling out the HICWA standards in the um, disability sector. We will, over time, start to develop um, such standards for the community services we provide. Um, there, you know, regulation is now a standard part of what we do, and we'll again have to collaborate in how we do that in a context where resources are very scarce. So we will have to work collaboratively on that. Implementing Children First is an important piece with the, the Child and Family Agency now moving away from the health service into a separate entity. We need to collaborate closely and make sure that we um, deliver on our requirements uh, as a sector in relation to that. Our intention is to develop regional implementation groups and a national reference group around quality and standards, <laughs> and Noel Mulville will be working with you in relation to that. The safeguarding adults, uh, that policy, signing off that and moving forward with its implementation in 2014 would be an important <coughs> uh, piece for us under this heading. Management and information systems. 
fundamental to successful implementation of a change. Within the health service, we haven't been as well served as we might with the information systems that we have. It often makes things harder in terms of collaborating and so on. We'll be working on that with the department and hopefully we'll start to make progress this year. I do see straightforward, simple things that we could do better, like a web-enabled a web uh, system of access so the people who need our services, people like yourselves, can access and gain access to information and advice and support. That's something that we're working on. I hope by the middle of the year to have some proposals about how we might do that. And again, your organisation and your agencies as participating in DFI are a huge resource to us, I think, in that. And we want to collaborate closely with you on that. And I think these are things that could make immediate differences just to people who, who find it difficult to surf the system and find the complexity of trying to integrate services very challenging. And that's something I think that we, we, we want to do. There is obviously a more comprehensive information system modeling that we have to put in place and we'll be doing that as well and working with you and of course jointly doing that will be important a really important piece for us is about for me it's about results driven it's about outcomes for people what will change what will be better on the ground what performance indicators do we need to establish and put in place that can measure how we're doing and where we can do better and that's the idea of moving from output to outcome focus a lot of work going on in that with ourselves within the system, with yourselves, and I think, again, that's something that we can jointly work on and make real over a period of time. Um, efficiency and effectiveness, I suppose I left the, the hard stuff about Haddington Road and efficiency and effectiveness towards the end, but I think that wasn't, just, like, it isn't all about money. I mean, much of what we're trying to do is about uh, people and service, but at the same time, there is an issue of efficiency and effectiveness. We do have a billion and a half resource, and there is an issue for us to demonstrate that we're utilizing that to best effect. And so, as I said, there's a five million efficiency review. We will be looking at strengthening the governance arrangements, and there's work going on in that already. But I think also there's opportunities around shared service, around procurement, around collaborating with the bulk buying capacity of a sector as big as we are, and to use that in a way that reduces costs, like things like insurance or other costs, collectively for all of us. And therefore that we can reduce the cost base of the system without impacting on service delivery. I think that's really important. I think also the issue about the strategic work and building a sustainable model, that work is really important and we need to work collectively about, it is about reducing cost, but it's also about being able to transfer cost and transfer resource and freeing up resource and better utilising it to deliver more for people with what we have. Um, the idea of service improvement teams is something that uh, I'm developing with Marion and the team, and that we will work with yourselves, drawing people from the system, from the voluntary sector and from the health service, to try to develop service improvement teams to support us. The expertise is among us. It's within our system. We deliver some top quality services. How do we translate those services and learn from them and translate it in a sustainable way? And again, my intention is to, the idea of salami slicing our system annually is something I don't agree with. I've never felt it a sensible thing to do. So the idea of 1.2% you know, or 1.5% you know, or whatever it was, was the reduction for the disability sector. And then we cut everybody by that. That doesn't make sense to me. You should target the efficiencies and the savings in the places where you think you can make them best. Haddington Road is an important part of that but also the efficiency review and all of that. So we will target and proportionately address the larger and the smaller agencies. But my position is that everybody should take their fair share. And that's an important piece of it. And that's what I have also been saying to my colleagues and the directorate, that the disability sector, along with everybody else, will take its fair share. And that's what we want to strive to. And we want to work with yourselves to be able to demonstrate that that's what we're doing to the Department of Health, Finance and others, who we are also looking for additional resource to do new things. On the Haddington Road of the Public Service Stability Agreement, um, as I said, there's around 15.5 million between that and the employment control framework and so on like that. So the pay and pay related savings. And again, I'm just summarizing there the enabling capacity the Haddington Road delivers. What I have been saying to the system is that while Haddington Road is something that was agreed within the public sector, um, as an agreement, uh, 
the flexibility it provides can be delivered across Section 38s and 9s and our whole system. That has to be done fairly because there are differences between 39s and 38s and you know, um, we have to look at that. But again, it's this issue of um, maximising the potential in terms of what we can deliver and being fair and equitable in relation to that and we can talk through how we would do that. I see Haddington Road as an enabler of the change programme. I don't see it separate from it. I see it as a key ingredient in giving us the flexibilities to do some of the change that we want to. We're doing a lot of work on this and we will share it with you um, and we will provide to DFI and other um, organisations uh, you know, the detailed documentation analysis that we think each organisation will be asked to complete and to make your own assessment as to maximising the contribution that you can. And then we will do that in an engaging way, but we'll also do it in a challenging way. We'll be trying to stretch the targets and try to uh, maximise what we can deliver from efficiencies and from um, implementing flexibility and so on like that. Also by you know, uh, what was envisaged in the VFM policy review and so on and, and, and implementing that in, in a focused way. And we will do that. It will be robust, it will be transparent, but it will also support us as a sector in being able to demonstrate to government that we are using the resources to best advantage and that the change that we have been talking about is being implemented and that we are delivering our fair share, like everybody else, across the system. And on that basis, it, I think, strengthens our position to be able to look for additional resource when we require it. Um, I suppose I, while well, I talked about efficiencies and, you know, resource savings and so on, I think in finishing, and similarly to what I did with the previous presentations, this whole issue of a value-based um, approach and the values that drive us being at the core of what we do. So in terms of implementing change, this will be fundamental to us, I think. And for me, previously I've talked about the notion of service and the notion of community. So it is about supporting communities. The people we support don't live in care groups, they live in communities. And the idea of service, and so I am a public servant, and the purpose of my job is to support and serve people. And I think we need to collectively, many of your organisations are doing that and are involved in it, or the cutting edge of that type of support and service. And I think by keeping those values at the core of what we do, building the trust that's necessary in embarking on a change programme like this between <coughs> us so that you can trust what we're saying to you and similarly we can trust what will be delivered by yourselves and many other agencies on our behalf and for people with a disability. Obviously the issue of you know, passion for excellence and, and, and high quality, that's at the core, but also to develop ourselves as a learning organisation and just learning from what we do and translating that learning across the system. So I just leave you with that. That is an important piece from our point of view. So thank you very much. Thanks.